share in three parts. Um, chapter one is, are you hungry? Chapter two is unicorn hearing loss. Um, and chapter three is here with me. So let's start at the beginning. So um, I was born with a hearing loss, second of three children. And um, when I was about four, I was playing in the room and my mother's uh, calling me to come and have a meal, you know, and no response. So she, she heads over, you know, Gerard, aren't you hungry? Yes. You know, I, of course I'm hungry. I'm always hungry. Um, and she said, well, I called you. Why didn't, why didn't you come? It's like, well, I didn't, I didn't hear you. And that was a big red flag for, for her because you see, you know, Southeast um, Asian kind of culture, food is the most important thing. So when my mother came home, my grandmother's question to her was, have you eaten or are you hungry? It's not how are you or, you know, how was your day? It's, are you hungry? So when a child is not responding to, are you hungry? The whole world is uh, crumbling down pretty quickly. So we, off we went to the audiologist um, and I hated the audiologist. Uh, throughout my childhood, I hated every time going into the audiology uh, booth and pressing the buttons and uh, being told maybe I'm faking because I wasn't hearing and my speech seemed to be fairly normal, doing okay at school. Um, and we did that for a couple more years before we were recommended a hearing aid. And very unusual for me, my, my mother, you know, actually, you know, sent it asked me whether I would wear one, you know, it's a beige hearing aid, which is not skin color um, for me uh, anyway. Um, and I said, no, because even then I knew that was some um, social suicide, you know? Um, and she said, okay, no. And the audiologist just looked at us and we were like, well, that's it. Um, so by the time I was 15, we had moved over to New Zealand and I was sitting there in class and all, up to all this time, I had to sit at the front of the class. That was the instruction, sit at the front of the class, don't use headphones. Um, that was as simple as it was. Um, and the classmate next to me was, was getting sick of me asking for repeats. So what I did was, um, sorry, what he did was, he said, look, my mom just started a new audiology clinic. I think you need to come in. So he's got these tiny hearing aids um, the government here will pay for it. So, you know, give it a go. So, okay, well, if it's small and it's hidden, I'll think about it. You know, I'm 15, getting quite self-conscious. Um, and yeah, so we went in. And what I did mention before is my younger brother was found to have the exact same hearing loss. So we both went in with mom. And eventually we got to the day, we were fitted with them and everything became loud. I could hear my shirt rustling, the carpet, um, the shoes on the carpet and things like that. And I was like, well, you know, is that right? Um, and on the car ride home, um, we could hear my mum from the back seat. So we were pretty excited. Up to that point, I thought people were just really good at faking that they could hear from the back seat and understand. Um, that was my normal. So I actually could understand. And so, so mum pulled over to the side and she had a bit of a cry because she didn't realise that that was our reality. Um, you know, because I think particularly the, the other clinicians, you know, like kids are happy. Um, if you don't know any different, that's your normal. That's what it is, you know. Um, so when I got those hearing aids, uh, it was very painful. It was very loud, put up with it. And then two weeks later, you go, go back in and the audiologist was like, yeah, no, pain is not normal, you know, and it shouldn't be that loud. And I'm like, well, thanks for telling us. Um yeah. <laughs> um, so the love-hate relationship with audiology continued. Um, I went from a phase where I thought I might need to work in a computer-based job away from people to going, I actually really like the banter and the social aspect. And um, I could actually hear the jokes from the person at the back of the class mocking the teacher. And I was like, oh, actually, this is, this is actually quite good. This is quite funny. But, you know. I went from the, the good kid to the one of the others, um, which for me was very important um, to, to sort of fit in. Okay, so chapter two, unicorn hearing loss. Um, my journey into uh, audiology was um, 
quite unexpected. I did a commerce degree because I wanted to start a business and that's, that's what I ended up doing. And towards the end of that degree, I actually had a big conversion and I actually went forward to, to train to be a Catholic priest for a couple of years. Um, and it didn't, it didn't quite work out for me, but on the way out, um, I was talking to a priest about it and, you know, looking at career options, because that's quite a dramatic change. You don't go from commerce to trying to be a priest to, I don't know what's next. And he was just fascinated by my hearing story, which I had never thought about because, you know, it's just a normal thing. And I thought, oh, you know, it sort of got me thinking that's a way to help people. It's very meaningful. Uh, it comes from a weakness. Um, and so I pursued audiology. And as soon as um, I did some papers, got in two days before the program started, three days later, Christchurch earthquakes, we were off for four months. It was uh, it was an interesting start to the audiology uh, degree. And during the course, I found that I did a lot of extra hours at night in the clinic just to try different things that my hearing loss seems to fit. Um, it's mild to moderate, which means sort of somewhere in the middle. It's the same in both ears. So I can actually pretty much wear any type of hearing aid and I'm very fortunate. So it's bad enough that I need hearing aids, but it's good enough that most things work. Um, and because they're similar, I, I get decent performance in background noise. And because I was young enough, when I first started, um, the brain caught up fairly well. I know, I know that's going to change over time, but so in tech speak, um, you know, a unicorn company is a company that um, is worth a billion dollars, started really small and very rare. Um, I feel that my hearing in some ways I've been way more fortunate than I, I could imagine, even though it's something that was supposed to be difficult. And um, as Steve shared earlier tonight, that straight away connects me with people. I, I didn't even realize it without even meaning to. Uh, I got into trouble a few times in clinic where my clinician, uh, as a student, clinician would make all these recommendations and say all these things and technical jargon and this and that. And the uh, client would just like turn and look at me and go, well, you wouldn't get it, but he gets it because he's got a hearing loss. And oh dear, yeah, that, that does not do you well the next few weeks at uni, I can tell you that. Um, even I, I'm not, I haven't even said anything. I'm just sitting in a corner. Um, so in about 2013, we moved to Australia and Australia has been very good to us. I uh, worked in different parts of audiology, uh, regional Australia and Canberra as well, uh, where I get to, I got to work at adults, peds, um, tinnitus, um, dizziness, as we heard some tonight as well. But there was a desire in me to also learn how to teach. So um, a research opportunity came along to do a PhD under scholarship at the hearing CRC at Melbourne Uni. And Caitlin was my supervisor, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, at that time, Better Hearing Australia Victoria's um, CEO, Michelle Berry, was also on my supervision team. Um, and my first teaching job, actually, Jess Vickovich, um, you know, got me in, got me in, and, you know, the training wheels. To... So when Soundfair asked if I can make time to do this, I was it was going to happen, you know, so I'm very grateful to be here. So, so for the final chapter here with me, I'll try and make it quick. I'm not sure how, how I'm going for time. I do tend to ramble. And if I'm speaking too quickly, I do apologize. I saw the Auslan translation and the subtitles and I thought I'm going to go full pace. Um, so I wanted to, um, when COVID hit and the lockdown started, universities quickly dropped their sort of casual staff, basically anyone that was working part-time. Um, and I thought it was an opportunity to use some of my commerce um, background, some of the research, which uh, we heard in the introduction was person-centered hearing care. So how we work with people and listen to them and coach them. Um, I want to create something that was something that we wish we had, uh, my family did, you know, growing up. Um, where things are explained in simple language, you know how to manage your care. My mom doesn't know how to describe my hearing. Um, she didn't know what we had exactly, what was the problem. She assumed it was too much earwax. Uh, it's got nothing to do with that. Um, that's how sometimes we don't do as well as we could as audiologists. And there's a lot of work we still 
need to do. Soundfair is doing good good work in that area. Um, yeah, so that opportunity to do that and have students um, over time and uh, shape their next generation of audiologists, uh, be with people, listen to them, uh, journey with them, um, show students that you can be a profitable non-sales focused clinic. That's still a thing. Uh, and um, as we sort of, as I sort of wrap up, um, it was, yeah, um, there was a guy this week that, that came in and he, he um, came in for a pre-employment test and for his dream job. And he didn't pass because of his hearing. Uh, it was one of those strict conditions. Um, and he was pretty emotional, you know, and one of the flexibilities of kind of being your own boss is I shut the doors because I didn't have anyone coming in, got him a glass of water. We sat in the waiting room, got out of the, you know, the, the testing area. It's all soundproof. It's, you know, it looks like a clinic. So we went out of the waiting area and just waited for him to, you know, work through his shock, his emotions. He never, he didn't think he would even have a hearing loss. And we does all we did that day. And I told him to ring me when he was ready. And he rang me the next day when he was feeling better. And then we went through the technical aspects of what to do next. What's his hearing actually like and, and that sort of thing. And, um, and that's a privilege. So for me, as I share, the personal and the professional just go hand in hand. I wouldn't be here without that personal story. And as I was writing it, I was like, well, hearing loss, funny term, it's, um, it's more hearing gain. I know it's, yeah, it's a bit cliche and yeah, I wish that for everyone here. Um, thank you. <laughs>